you're gonna break into as a podcast, went live on the net, and transformed into a full-blown empire across the web, on Fight Now TV, and on radio stations around the world. It's the only daily boxing talk radio show on the planet, hosted by the only guy with the balls to do it. Many have stepped into the ring, many have tried to take the belt, and one by one, they've fallen. Another victim of the undisputed heavyweight champion of Boxing Talk Radio. Talking Boxing with Billy C is on now. My style is impetuous, my defense is impregnable, and I'm just ferocious, I want your heart. And we're coming to you live. From the Billy C. Studio in Lake George, New York, I'm Bill Callagher, and it's time for Talking Boxing with Billy C. Good morning, good day, good evening, whenever you're listening. Hope you're doing all right. We've got a busy show scheduled for today, like we always do, every day, five days a week, 50 weeks, at least 50 weeks a year. Alex Papa, oh, well, before I get into that, the show's being brought to you in part by Camp Aaron Tomkovich, if you're looking for a lawyer. Use the ones that keep my ass out of trouble. That's Camp and Aaron Tomkovich. Give him a call today, 845-221-4099. 845-221-4099. Let Camp and Aaron Tomkovich knock out your legal problem. 845-221-4099. The shows those are being brought to you in part by my friends down at the Halftime Bar and Grill, Route 9, South Glens Falls. Man, if you like cool people hang with, drink specials all the time, live entertainment on Friday and Saturday nights, and fantastic food to stuff your face with, you're going to love the Halftime Bar and Grill. Give them a call for directions or reservations. 518-792-4869. 518-792-4869. Halftime Bar and Grill. Route 9. South Glens Falls. Alex Papali is going to be joining us a little bit uh, to do the blast from the past. We're going to be talking uh, uh, about Kevin Kelly. My man, Scotty Kraus. Is scheduled to join us up here at the uh, up here uh, up at the top of the hour at the top of the hour. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, a couple of big fights that uh, took place, like the uh, Bam Bam Rios uh, and Mike Alvarado uh, second fight. So uh, we'll be chatting with that and, and some other stuff. Um, you know, uh, next week uh, we got a weird schedule going on. So uh, um, you know, uh, make sure you uh, tune into the website uh, to see what's happening. Uh, uh, we're going to be uh, doing some live stuff, so uh, make sure you uh, check that out. I- I'll try and give you uh, uh, an update uh, on Friday. So um, Now, normally we do the uh, uh, Talk To Me show 
Talk to Me Man show on, on Mondays, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We may do a marathon of Talk to Me uh, next week, meaning open up the phone lines uh, because we're going to be doing some broadcast uh, uh, live uh, uh, from uh, several different locations. So uh, we may uh, do that. So make sure you keep an eye uh, on uh, our Facebook and Twitter accounts. And if you're not a friend uh, or if you're not part of the Talk Unboxing with Billy C. group under Facebook, I suggest you join um, so you can get all the updates. We will send out a broadcast message uh, when uh, when we're live so you can call in and, and do all that stuff. But uh, uh, anyway, I, what we're going to do is uh, uh, I have uh, several uh, emails I'm going to uh, read uh, rather than uh, take some of the ones that normally would be on the Talk To Me Man show. We're going to try to get them uh, in today. Uh, we do have some news we want to talk about, and uh, uh, we've got a bunch of other stuff going on. So um, let's try and get it all done, starting with right now, Burke Boxing. I'm hoping this is my man Lou Burke from uh, out west from the New Mexico area. they got a fine team, and uh, I'm hoping uh, it's him. But uh, if not, it, it doesn't matter. Burke Boxing says, awesome show. Thanks, Burke Boxing. Uh, we appreciate you uh, tuning in, and uh, we uh, we want as many uh, viewers and listeners as we can possibly get, either uh, through the Fight Now television channel, uh, any of our radio affiliates, uh, or, of course, uh, the Internet uh, uh, on BillyCBoxing.com or, or uh, through uh, uh, our podcast, which is uh, important to us, the premium podcast subscriptions. Uh, if you want to support this show, the best thing to do is become a premium podcast subscriber, and you can do that very simply by visiting our website, www.BillyCBoxing.com, and on the left-hand side, you'll see a... Uh, uh, a banner that says uh, Billy C. Premium. Click that and you'll get all the information. Um, Bigavax says, uh, if you're bringing Tony Treem to talk about Ali's legacy, then you might as well be bringing Given Quality to talk about Manny Pacquiao. Um, you know, Tony Treem got, uh, uh, him and I had a conversation one time uh, about Muhammad Ali, and, and the viewers and listeners uh, have forever labeled uh, Tony a uh, Muhammad Ali hater. Um, you know, the bottom line, and, and Bigovac was uh, responding to the uh, heavyweight spotlight we did yesterday on Kenny Norton. If you missed it, it is under Tony Treem's section of the website, www.billycboxing.com, under the heavyweight spotlight. It was a great one on Kenny Norton. And we did talk about um, the three fights uh, between uh, Kenny Norton and Muhammad Ali. Um, let me just say this. Let me just say this. If you were my age, if you're my age or, or older, you will understand if you're, you know, 40 years old or younger, uh, and I have, uh, I'm leaving some time in between, but uh, uh, if you're 40 years old or younger, you may not get it because you weren't, you're not old enough to, uh, uh, to understand what was going on with Muhammad Ali uh, during his active career. There were many times when people, uh, I, I, listen, I know for myself, I, I'll speak for myself, um, there were times I loved Muhammad Ali, and there were times I absolutely hated him and wished uh, uh, somebody would would beat him. You know, I, you know, rooting against him, I should say. You know, um, it was just the nature of the times. It was it was the way he was, and all of that stuff. Now, fast forward it to to the present time, and everybody likes Muhammad Ali because of uh, the appreciation that we give him. Uh, for his career and, and of course, uh, uh, his struggles uh, today with Parkinsonism, uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, so, I, I, I mean, it, it's a lot easier to to be critical of, of people when they talk negatively about Ali today. But if we were having this conversation 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, uh, you know, you, you definitely, uh, uh, or 20, 30 years ago, I guess, uh, 40 might be too long, but... Uh, Maybe not. No, let me, let me, no, I guess not. Um, you know, the bottom line, let's see, 70, 80, 90, 2000. Yeah, 40 years ago is not. Uh, I had to, almost had to take off my shoes, man. But, uh, you know, I, talk to anybody. Talk to your father. Talk to your grandfather, whatever. And uh, ask them what was going on. I remember uh, what, for the Frazier fights, one time I, I was rooting for Ali and one time I was rooting for Frazier. You know, uh, and the third time it was just, uh, you know, man, we we just want to uh, see another great one. As far as uh, uh, Jimmy Young, I, I remember watching Jimmy Young 
uh, beat Muhammad Ali. I talked about it during the heavyweight spotlight yesterday, and I was pissed off at Ali for years for robbing that fight. And who didn't root for Leon Spinks uh, at the time when uh, when Leon uh, upset Muhammad Ali? So, uh, and then everybody, you know, rooted for Ali to regain his his belt. So. Um, you had to be able to to watch the fight, and 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 who wasn't rooting for Ali when he fought Big George Foreman? Everybody thought he was going to get killed, and uh, he beats uh, Foreman. So, um, you know, uh, the bottom line is, uh, um, you know, uh, you got to take it into t- context. And and my man uh, Hanging Fire, he's in the chat room right now. And uh, he says, you know, Tony did apologize. Tony doesn't have to apologize. This is an opinion-based show, you know. And, yes, uh, Hanging Fire is right that uh, Tony, you know, didn't want the, the viewers and listeners to think that he was an Ali hater. Um, but uh, uh, when we first were talking about Ali, uh, it was uh, uh, about who the greatest heavyweights were. And we, we didn't think, neither one of us think that he's the greatest heavyweight of all time, you know. So, I, I mean, um, you know, whatever. Whatever, it's a show based on opinions, and uh, uh, I find it funny that uh, uh, you guys are still uh, bringing that up. But uh, uh, nonetheless, I find it uh, pretty humorous. Uh, bigger back, I, I know his uh, uh, meaning. He wasn't uh, knocking anything on Tony Treem, uh, but I like the analogy. <laughs> Tony Treem uh, talking about uh, how much he uh, uh, loves Ali, and uh, might as well have a uh, given quality uh, talk about how much he loves Pacquiao. It's definitely a parallel there. Um, Juggernaut, uh, says, uh, it's so nice when you guys put, uh, the spotlight on a more modern day fighter. Now he's commenting on uh, the heavyweight spotlight as well. Um, you know, I, it, again, I, I think it's an age thing, man. You know, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about, uh, Kenny Norton as a, as a modern day fighter. Well, you know, he fought 30, 30 years ago, you know, um, Mike Tyson fought 25 years ago, you know? So, uh, yeah, we, we try. We try to keep the door open. So thanks for the email, Juggernaut. We're going to take a short break. When I come back, i got several more emails. we got Scotty Krause coming up. we got Alex Pally, Papali coming up. we got a whole lot of things coming up. If you're in upstate New York and you need a trucking company, then you need Roselli Enterprises. Roselli Enterprises is trucking at its finest. They have it all. Dump trucks, dump trailers, walking floors, flatbeds, flow boys, tankers, loaders, and a full line of roll-off containers for any job, big or small. Roselli Enterprises is also the source for all your sand, gravel, and topsoil needs. Visit them on the web at RoselliTrucking.com or call 315-433-5115. That's 315-433-5115 and tell them Billy C sent you. Are you ready, America? Then let's get it on with Fight Now TV. It's time, fight fans. Your channel has arrived. All the fights, all the names, all the action. From world-class boxing events to mixed martial arts showdowns and other combat sports matchups, Fight Now TV delivers the hits and more. Call your television provider and tell them you want to get it on with Fight Now TV. For more details, go to fightnow.com. We've got a great matchup tonight. Fighting out of the left corner is the number one ranked contender. No, he is not. I'm sorry, but who are you? I am the ideal computer. I am programmed to provide only fair and unbiased boxing rankings. This fighter is the number 15 ranked contender. Fair and unbiased boxing rankings? That's a new concept. Actually, it is not. The IBO has provided unbiased computerized rankings for many years. Well, we've still got a great fight tonight, folks. In the left corner is the number 15 ranked contender. The IBO, the champion of integrity. Learn more at IBOboxing.com. Check out BillyCBoxing.com now, or feel the wrath of the mighty mustache. Oh, that hurts. Why are you doing that to my face? I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> That's BillyCBoxing.com. Consider this your warning. As a young boy, all Billy C. dreamed about was one day having his own catchphrase and we're back and we're back one boy one dream one day everyone will say and we're back 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 catchphrase coming soon to a theater near you
And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Box on the Billy C Show. You're watching a replay on LDL TV. Glad you could join us. Coming up in a little bit, we got Scotty Krause. Going to chat about uh, the fights this past weekend. Maybe some other stuff, of course. Got Alex Papali coming up. We're going to do another blast from the past. This time it's on former world champion Kevin Kelly. So we'll be chatting with Alex in a little bit. Um, reading a couple of emails, commenting on uh, some uh, uh, comments in the chat room uh, about Ali. You know, the bottom line is, you know, during his active career, you know, you loved him and you hated him. You know, at the same time, most people did. I, I, I would challenge uh, uh, to find. I would challenge you to find someone that just absolutely loved Muhammad Ali from the time he busted onto the scene as Cassius Clay, um, right on through. You know, um, now it's a lot easier to find people who love him because, you know, he, he he's become bigger than boxing. You know, but uh, again, during uh, <laughs> during his time, you know, I, I I take this abuse in the chat room. You know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, um, stuff and uh, uh, my man hanging fire who's got his feet up on the desk. You know, a typical government worker. Uh, we're com- I was complaining about my love life, and he says, "Try, <laughs> try parting your hair on the other side." Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm starting to notice. Uh, I'm, lo- I'm becoming frolically challenged. You know, hair frolically challenged. I think they call it. I don't know. Um, no pack drill says. Uh, uh, I was just having an exchange uh, uh, of views with uh, a fellow uh, boxing fan, who I passed the link on to your show. Thank you very much. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing if Crawface uh, joins us. But uh, he says uh, he probably knows more about boxing uh, than I do, but uh, he asked where I placed Norton, and he said, uh, I'm not qualified to say. I, don't, I do know for an absolute fact that Norton won two of his fights against Ali because I've seen them several times, including, the last, uh, including within the last few years. My dad uh, has them in his collection and uh, other... Uh, the other one I saw it only once when I was like fifteen or sixteen, just like the uh, and it was just the highlights. So I can't say must review it. Uh, what do I think about uh, uh, Norton? Uh, where his place is? Um, well, you know, if if you look at just the heavyweights, in my opinion, Norton's got a place pretty high up there. I mean, we were talking about this yesterday on the spotlight, and uh, Kenny Norton. I mean, listen, let's just say this. You know, let, let me put it in perspective, and I tried to yesterday. Uh, Klitschko has a 79-inch reach. He's six foot seven, 79-inch reach. Kenny Norton uh, was six foot three, all right, and he had an 80-inch reach. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means that he had a chance to out-jab a jabber. You know, um, he had, uh, you know, tremendous uh, power. Uh, he was able to take a punch, even though he was stopped a couple of times. But, you know, by arguably, with the exception of the the early one in his career, arguably by uh, two of the hardest punches uh, the sport has ever seen. in uh, uh, George Foreman and, and, of course, Ernie Shavers. Um, he did uh, a lot of things well. He wasn't known for one specific thing. In other words, uh, like we just said, Ernie Shavers, known for punching power not known for a jab, not known for footwork. Um, you know, Kenny Norton had a pretty damn good arsenal in, in every area. He had a good jab. He had power. He could throw multiple punches. You know, he, he had an overhand right. He had a good hook. You know, he had a stiff jab. You know, his defense was, was deceiving. He did have the, the, the arm, you know, the cross arm uh, uh, defense. That was his skill. He did kind of go in at you like that. Uh, but he can mix it up. He could box. He could take a punch. I don't know, man. I think he's up there. I think he's in uh, heavyweights all time. You know, he's got to be in the top 20. Got to be. Well, got to be in the top 25 if you're going to put him down. I, I don't know. I mean, off the top of my head, name 20 fighters better than Kenny Norton of all time. I, I don't know. I don't know. And he fought in uh, arguably the, the toughest era uh, the sport has ever seen in the heavyweights. You know, so he's up there, no pack drill. Uh, my man uh, Marcus Otavio says, uh, uh, it's no coincidence that a diehard David Hay fan was way off base about the Rios Alvarado 2 fight. 
you should have boxing fans. You have boxing fans, and then you have David Hay fans. Uh, he says, if someone thinks Rio Salvarado was boring, you got to watch another sport. I agree with you. Marcus is my man. I, I, I agree with him, man. You know, whoever didn't think that uh, Bam Bam Rios against Mike Alvarado, both fights, if you didn't think both fights were entertaining, then I, I agree with, uh, with Marcus. You know, you, you're not a boxing fan. Go watch something else. You know, uh, I don't know what to say. And, and I like his uh, analogy. You know, you, a boxing fan might not necessarily be a David Hay fan. Uh, I, I agree. You know, if you get sucked up, you see, David Hay is, is, a, is a genius at marketing strategies, uh, and you got to give his uh, his his boss his uh, his boss his crony trainer uh, Adam Booth uh, similar accolades. Uh, they know how to manipulate the, the media. They know how to uh, you know f do the least amount of risk for the maximum amount of reward. I, I give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, but you, you you can't say that uh, that the guy is uh, uh, you know paid his dues and and he's he's as good as he says he is. And he's not as good as people think he is either, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks for the email, Marcus. Sky A says, uh, Billy C, does the whole gun drama thing with Robert Go Square mean no fight on May 5th uh, with Floyd? Absolutely not. I, You know, it, it may alter uh, some parameters around the fight. And what I mean is... Uh, um, you know, if he's if Robert Agos Guerrero is sidetracked, wondering what's going to happen, um, yes, this could affect it. Uh, it is unfortunate; it was a stupid thing. But the, as far as the fight goes, uh, it's not like he's going to be thrown into the slammer. Uh, you know, before the fight, uh, I, I have a, a feeling that they're going to, uh, um, you know, throw this case out. I, I, you know, as much as New York is uh, uh, pretty strict, I mean, the gun was unloaded. And he had checked it in at another airport, and he did make uh, the attempt to do it. You know, he could uh, cry stupid, stupidity, which is no excuse, but I, I think in this case he is going to get off. Um, but that's my, uh, uh, that's my opinion. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the man who thinks that uh, that fight was boring, the Rios uh, Alvarado 2 fight, said he turned it off in the 10th round to go watch cartoons, which I don't believe him. I really don't believe him, but... Uh, uh, he's back anyway. I'm glad that uh, he's communicating with us again. T. Bruce says, Bills, I don't care about none of this mess you're spruing about Hayes' resume. Hayes, the only heavyweight that's fighting like a damn welterweight. Uh, he has the footwork. He has speed. He has char uh, charisma. Uh, this is uh, the fight. This, at capital letters, is the fight that the fans want to see. This is the biggest money fight. This is the fight has the most hype. And Vitaly wants nothing to do with it. He says, I don't care about how many bums Hay fought. I don't care about none of that. The fans want Hay versus Vitaly. They say if Hay beat Chisora, he would have the fight, right? He says, well, what's going on? I don't care about uh, many heavyweight fights, uh, how many heavyweight fights Hay has, how many the Klitschko's have, none of that. Everyone at heavyweight is big. Slow. Everyone at heavyweight is a big slow bum to to T. To uh, Hay is the fight that uh, fans have been wanting to see. All I care about is Vitaly fighting the most important fight out there. That's Hay. It's where the money is. It's where the fans want. So why isn't it happening? Once Hay blasted Chisora, he automatically earned the fight, considering that not only is he the guy that everyone wants to see Vitaly fight, uh, but also he beat the guy Vitaly struggled against. This is how they set up fights back in the old days. Uh, two guys fight common opponents so the fans can compare their performances. Then they fight each other. So let's get let's get it popping, man. Um, I, hey, I agree with you. I, I appreciate your uh, uh, your opinion. I don't agree with anything you're saying. Uh, I don't know how many people, uh, how many fans want to see the fight, with the exception of the David Hay fans. Um, I, you know, and and I do think it's relevant. Uh, to uh, to to compare the two uh, heavyweight uh, resumes, and and uh, you know what you're saying is you want to see uh, a, a fight. I mean, let's 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 look at it really in perspective. David Hay is a non-entity in the heavyweight division, in my opinion. Only be, even though we have him ranked, and I say this only because of his infrequent fighting in, at that weight class. You know, you're going to give him credit for fighting Chisora. Fine, fine. I give him credit for fighting Chisora. You know, but that automatically earns him a shot at, Vit a shot at Vitaly. How? How? You know, Vitaly has been a champion, and, and I pointed all of that out. You know, um, he doesn't even know if he's going to fight anymore. He's 41 years old. You know, I, the, the reason why Hay wants Vitaly is because of the money. You're right. 
because everybody that fights a Klitschko makes a big payday. You know, and and if uh, you know David Hay fights, he he does have a following in in Europe. You know, so uh, listen, um, I don't think Vit- it's it's Vitaly's baseball. He gets to pitch. He gets to pick who he wants to fight. You know, I listen. According to T. Bruce, it's a huge fight. I, not to me. You know, I want to see David Hay fight somebody else and beat him. Then we be, he becomes a mandatory fine. And and don't for a minute think Vitaly Klitschko is ducking David Hoy. If that's what you're alluding to, uh, you, you you you've you've lost your mind, really. Um, David Hay is not, and nobody will duck David Hay. David Hay ducks other people. There's not a heavyweight active today that wouldn't love to get a piece of David Hay. Wouldn't love it. You know, I, I mean, come on, come on. I want to see him. Hey, go answer the poll question right now up on BillyCBoxing.com. Who would you rather see? Uh, you know, uh, him fight, you know, Tyson Fury, you know, they, you want to see him fight uh, David Hay? You want to see David Hay fight Tyson Fury? You know, uh, go vote, man. You, you know, go 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 vote right now. It's a great poll question. Um, my man, Dave Wilcox, Dave Ma, used to uh, be part of this show uh, at one time. He says, uh, uh, dude, am I the only one who's uh, irritated as, and I'm not going to use the word he used, but let's just say poop. Uh, with uh, Roy Jones and his insistence on referring to his broadcast partners as son. And he, he does quotes here, Crawford is good, son. He's fast, son, et cetera, et cetera. What are we, 12 years old? Um, you know, i tell you what, Roy Jones is, uh, thanks for the email, my man Dave. I uh, would love to have uh, him uh, uh, come on uh, for old time's sake uh, at some point uh, so he could be critical of, uh, of Roy Jones. I, I, you know, Roy has been uh, losing some brownie points lately, huh? Um, you know, he's uh, and Dave's not the only guy that's uh, aggravated by uh, Roy Jones Jr. Um, you know, I, the first time I, I always I always look at Roy Jones on HBO as as the two lives of Roy Jones Jr. Uh, the first one uh, I couldn't stand him because every time he referred to something, he would weasel in Roy Jones Jr. And then refer to himself as Roy Jones Jr. in the third third person. And it used to drive me insane. Then he lost his gig at HBO. And now this second life at HBO, he's come back. And he was doing a pretty good job up until two shows ago. And he started with, the, you know, the first, I think what started it all was when they were asking him a comment on something. And he says, I know how to beat Mayweather, but I'm not going to say. I think that was the comment. I'm not going to say. And and I remember getting a slew of emails. You're not going to say that's what you're being paid for. That's what you're on the show for, man. You're on your show to give us your opinions. Why? And he and he wouldn't divulge what he was talking about. And and then since then, uh, you know, he's he's had some bad performances to say the least. He's back to referring to himself in third person. He took uh, credit for a, a move that uh, one of the fighters did. Uh, you know, tapping the glove to the shoe. He said that's Roy Jones' move. Uh, now he's uh, referring to everybody as son. Uh, maybe he's starting to get a little punchy. I don't know. Maybe maybe he is. But you guys have been pretty tough on Roy. Uh, you know. <laughs> you know. I, I, listen. I I don't know what to say. You know. I mean, to tell you the truth, I think uh, I think uh, HBO needs to revamp the whole broadcast team. You know, I mean, Harold Letterman solid. You know, who, who who does it better than Harold? I love Harold. Harold stays. I, I hate to say it, not that I'm a big fan, but Max stays. I think they lost a, a huge uh, asset when uh, Bron- uh, when uh, Pappas uh, uh, decided to go to, uh, uh, to 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 the Golf Channel, which which I found uh, amazing. Uh, Jim Lampley's got to go, man. He's got to go. Jim Lampley is has worn out his time. He's, you know, he ruins the broadcast. He can't do a broadcast without referring to punch stats. He can't even come and he doesn't even know what's going on until he looks at the punch stats, which I think is ridiculous because it's all subjective, you know. And, and as far as Roy Jones goes, I, I don't know, man. Uh, obviously, um, the fans, you guys all, all think that his, his time has come and gone. I, they need to revamp. They need to revamp, man, you know, but uh, that's that's my opinion. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll be willing to, to take a shot, you know, Max and I, you know, I, I'll, I'll work with Max. I'll be Max's crony, you know, uh, whatever, you know, I, I'll lead it. I'll, I'll, I'll do a better job than, than Jim, you know, but what, what's, what's wrong with, uh, um, you know, uh, Barry Tompkins, you know, I know he's over with Showtime now, but he was great on HBO. He was on HBO. remember, you know, so, uh, I, I don't know. 
The only thing I like about uh, HBO's broadcast team is they don't yell at you. You know, they're, they're biased and everything else, but they're not yelling at you. They're not screaming at you. But uh, anyway, hey, listen, I'm going to take a short break. When I come back, we're scheduled to have uh, Scotty Krause. That's right. Scott Krause will be on, and uh, we'll see what he's got to say about the, the Rios fight. And maybe we'll throw in a little Kenny Norton stuff and maybe uh, David Hay and uh, get his thoughts. We'll be back in two. Are you ready, America? Then let's get it on with Fight Now TV. It's time, fight fans. Your channel has arrived. All the fights, all the names, all the action. From world-class boxing events to mixed martial arts showdowns and other combat sports matchups, Fight Now TV delivers the hits and more. Call your television provider and tell them you want to get it on with Fight Now TV. For more details, go to fightnow.com. Broadcasting in all corners of the globe on the web and radio. He would scoff at a stretch of that man, I would think. Hey, You're listening to Talkin' Boxing with Billy C. From upstate New York in the good old U.S. of A. Boxing is here to stay because we are here to stay. The best two hours of boxing talk on the airwaves. Hey, fight fans, check out KOFantasyBoxing.com. KO Fantasy Boxing is boxing's only trademarked fantasy game. Check it out, www.KOFantasyBoxing.com. Select your own gym, your own fighters, track them through a season that can last from three months to a year, depending upon which league you join. you got to check this out, man, www.KOFantasyBoxing.com. Join it today. Again, www.KOFantasyBoxing.com. And tell them Billy C. sent ya. Now back to Talkin' Boxing with Billy C., the only radio host man enough to take a punch from Mike Tyson. Wait a minute, man. Hold, hold, hold on there. Jeremy, man, uh, I need you to take this one, all right? Wait, what? What? No way. I, I, I can't do this. Need I remind you I'm Billy C., damn it? Now put on that mustache and get in there. Hey, hey, look at me. I'm Billy C. <laughs> The undisputed heavyweight champion of boxing talk radio. It's Talking Boxing with Billy C. Test one, two. Test one, two. My fellow Americans, good evening. Welcome back to Talking Boxing with Billy C. It's great to be here discussing the sweet science with everybody. I love boxing. I love talking boxing. That's what I do. Um, Bill. Oh, wait, what, uh, Bill. What? Why are you interrupting yeah, um, me? What? Wrong, wrong. What's wrong, the problem? Billy, what? C. I did not have. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have to ask you. Wrong speech. Be, what do you mean, wrong, Billy C? What's going Sorry. on here? Fine, I'll go. I just wanted to talk some boxing on TPS Radio. Got that? That's all I wanted to do. I don't need your damn show. I'll get my own. Talking wrestling with the other Billy C. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. I've always been a Hulkamaniac anyway. <laughs> Guest in live, brother. Welcome back to Talking Boxing with Billy C on the mighty TPS Radio.net, brother. What you gonna do, brother? And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. Glad you could join us. And if you don't have Fight Now in your sports channel lineup, you need to call your local television provider and tell them that you want Fight Now right now. It's that simple. Pick up the phone and call. For all the information about the channel, you can find it on their website, www.fightnow.com. Speaking of now, joining us, my main man, Scotty Krause. What's up, brother? Hey, Bill. How you doing? Oh, better than uh, the stream. We've been having some trouble with the... Uh, uh, with the stream, uh, we drop for no reason. You know, it's it's almost as bad as this phone system. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, a couple of things. First and foremost, uh, the fight uh, uh, with Bam Bam Rios and, and Mike Alvarado, the second one or even the first one. To me, Scott, I, I, you know, I, for, I, I, not, I, I don't even know what to say. I mean, th- to me, they were all, both fights were very exciting. The The second one, of course, was was uh extremely exciting and you know i actually had a, a listener that that felt it was a boring fight and you know i even even floyd mayweather fans have to admit that it, it was far from boring 
But it wasn't exactly a, a barroom brawl. I mean, there was some. There, I thought there was some display of of the sweet science. Maybe not from a bicycle standpoint, but clearly uh, there was some talent shown in that ring by both fighters. What, what's your thoughts on the fight? And you know, where does it sit in terms of uh, the type of fight, the style of fight? Well, I think it stands as a. Uh, as about, you put the two fights together. Let's not separate them. Let's put them both together and. You know, I think they're modern classics. I think they fall into the category of, um, you know, fights like uh, Gotti Ward and Castillo Corrales and Vasquez uh, Marquez. And, and you can rank them wherever you want and say, well, maybe they're not quite there or maybe they're somewhere <clears throat> is sprinkled in between some of those fights. But because they've done it twice now and we've gotten a you know, very similar uh, a very similar type of fight. And I think you know these two guys are made for each other, and I think it's uh, uh, you're going to get a great fight every single time. And you know, I, I think the sweet science is on display in all of those fights I just mentioned. I think even in the you know the the barn burners where they stand and they trade, there's still the sweet science being displayed. I mean, there's still a mentality of skill in boxing. You know, I think Vasquez Marquez to me stands out as. Uh, uh, two highly skilled fighters who still gave us the kind of thrill that a toe-to-toe kind of war uh, gives us. Uh, there's still skill and there's still talent and there's still sweet science involved. Sweet science is not just uh, you know dancing around the ring and uh, jabbing and uh, you know never getting hit. Uh, there's there's more to it than that, as we've discussed before. And I think uh, <clears throat> of the two, Mike Alvarado probably showed you know uh, a little more diversity in uh, the, the, the display of the sweet science and uh, and talent which is why he won this fight he you know he was able to not just stand and trade at times but he he moved laterally he gave uh, rios uh, um um you know different looks and rios is a guy that's just coming he's coming straight ahead and and he wants to bang and Alvarado, uh, you know, I think frustrated him a little bit with with some of his movement, with his jab, and I think that uh, that was a, a talent on display, and I think that's what won in the fight. You know, I, I think I think what's happening here is that the definition of the sweet science is is getting all whacked out because, and and this is something Alex Papali and I have talked about a lot because you know Alex was uh, a helpful, big time helpful with with my book and stuff, and uh, we, you know we together uh, discussed the era. Uh, of Tom Molino, which was the 1800s, bare knuckle uh, boxing at, at its rawest state, and that was considered the sweet science back then. So the sweet science, by definition, has evolved. I think what's happened today in 2013 is that everyone, you know, uses Floyd Mayweather as a symbol of the sweet science, and and I think it's kind of sad because you know people when they refer to the sweet science, they all they think of is a is a boxer. A guy that, you know, they we get thrown in our face all the time, hit and not get hit. You know, a, a guy that goes in, he, he nails you with a couple of shots, and then, bam, he's out of harm's way. You know, he's not engaging, but he's displaying sweet science, and I disagree. I think um, the Rios fight showed a, a couple of things. Number one, as far as uh, Rios is concerned, he was able to get in close and land those short, sharp punches, Scotty, that... You know, those were the types of punches that defined careers in, you know, schlups like Rocky Marciano and Jake LaMotta and, and, and you know, Rocky Graziano and, and the list goes on and on and on. You know, and, and he did that. You were right. Mike Alvarado was able to uh, mix things up. He boxed a little. He, he, he went toe-to-toe a little bit. Um, you know, the only thing I, I think they both need to work on a little bit is is defense other than using the gloves, you know, maybe move your head a little bit, maybe bob a little, something like that. But uh, but I thought that there was some science displayed for sure. Absolutely. And now let's just not mistake things here. Neither guy is a complete fighter. I mean, when people talk about the sweet science, you mentioned Floyd Mayweather, they, they'll throw in Pernell Whitaker and, and, and fighters like that, but they weren't complete fighters either. You know, they didn't have the knockout power. They didn't display the ability to absorb punishment. I mean, all of these are traits of fighters from the very beginning of, of fighting. And, 
you know, while they don't have the defense of a Whitaker or a Mayweather, they have other things. And boxing to me is, uh, you know, however you want to define it. You want to throw in sweet science, you throw out sweet science. You know, maybe you just even forget that title altogether. To me, boxing is at its best when you overcome adversity, when you're able to suffer, when you're able to absorb pain, when you're able to endure and you overcome and you're victorious. And that's what attracts people to the sport more than some definition of the sweet science. People are attracted to fights like what we saw Saturday night, not just from a bloodlust standpoint, but, but, but everyday life is hard. Most people who are watching boxing aren't people sitting in palaces, people sleeping in silk sheets, people, you know, with, with you know, million-dollar bank accounts. They're hard workers. There are people watching. There are people who endure their own suffering, their own pain in life. And boxing represents metaphorically that life, that, that ability to absorb, to suffer, and to come back and to keep fighting in the midst of it. And that's the attraction to me. And I think that's what the attraction is to a fight like Alvarado and Rios. I don't think it's just as simple as two guys beating each other up. I think it's a symbol of everyday life. It's a symbol of how hard it is to live in this world at times and how we're all called upon to, you know, to, to suffer at times and to endure that suffering and to have to you know, dig down and overcome that suffering and that is attractive to most people they see that and 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 they want to be like that and they admire these warriors who are able to do that and uh you know, to me that's what boxing is it's it's a metaphor for everyday life and i think you see it more in a fight like alvarado rios than you do in a typical mayweather or whitaker fight or or or, or the fights where the so-called sweet science, as it's defined by some, is on display. That is to be respected, you know, the defense and the slickness of some boxers. I'm not saying, you know, I don't like that or no one's attracted to that in its own right. That's special in and of itself. But let's not just take all of boxing and categorize it one way. What we saw Saturday night was, was art. It was violent and brutal, but it was still art, and it was what – is so attractive, like I said at times, uh, to this sport. We see ourselves, and we want to be like these guys, and maybe not in the ring, but maybe you know, overcoming a job loss or a loss of a loved one or personal sickness or, or our own pain, our own suffering, whatever it is, we look to them and, and, and we seek to overcome just like they do. And to me, that's the attraction with the sport, and we saw that. Uh, uh, Saturday night. I agree with you, man, and that's a great uh, analogy. And you know, it, I, I think uh, a lot of people uh, will agree because statistically, you know, uh, when the economy worldwide is is at its worst, boxing's been at its best. So it's clearly uh, a release. So uh, great point there. And and you know, I, I made an issue yesterday. I, I made a statement. I said, listen, if we, you know, boxing is so divided now. Anyway, if we divided boxing into two sports. Uh, you know the sweet science as as people define it today and and fighting if if boxing was considered fighting and 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 you know the sweet science and of course you know uh using a uh, uh, floyd mayweather style as 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 the sweet science and using the fighting style as a rios uh alvarado you know which would have more fans which would sell more tickets who would want to go see more of the fights and and i would be shocked if if an overwhelming uh you know amount of people went with the uh the fighting side because uh, of the entertainment value i, I think there's just a handful uh, of people that and and don't get me wrong i appreciate the sweet science i just think that there's a time when you have to engage and i use that uh sugar ray robinson as an example he could box better than most but but many times he engaged so uh you know you got to have that line man you got to know when uh, to show what you can do, I think. I think the greatest fighter 
that I've ever seen to display that was Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, there was a time to box and move, and there was a time to stand your ground and fight and and, and take the punishment and, and, and overcome. And, you know, I think he displayed that more than any fighter in his career. You're right. And, uh, you know, no nobody can say anything about uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, ducking fighters and this and that, things that are going to be uh, brought up forever with uh, with Mayweather, I, I would imagine. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that's something that you can't say. And, and you know, the the other sad thing, uh, and we'll get off the subject, is, you know, when you, you, you mentioned Sugar Ray Leonard and... You know, he he's kind of not talked about today as much as I would have thought. Like, if you asked me um, when he was active, you know, back in the, the late 70s and 80s um, uh, about Sugar Ray Leonard and, and, you know, what would his legacy be, you know, uh, you know where does he fit in, in boxing lore and stuff, I would think that he would still be as popular discussion about boxing the way Mike Tyson is today. Uh, and he's not, Scotty. He he really isn't. I mean, people know who he is. You hear about him on Dancing with the Stars. You hear him uh, uh, about him doing this and the other thing. Uh, but you know, people aren't really talking about his career as much as I thought they would. Well, I think people are still attracted to him. I think he's still a boxing legend. But I think uh, if you compare him to someone like Mike Tyson. That's that's a little different. I mean, Mike Tyson's a phenomenon. I mean, he. It, it's funny to me, and uh, nah, maybe not not funny. It's just. It's intriguing, and it's something I'm enjoying sitting back and sort of watching evolve and develop this character of Mike Tyson. You know, he was a guy that was so self-destructive. Well, well, he started off, to me, I still think he he's one of the greatest heavyweights of all time because I, I judge him by what I thought he could do before he self-destructed. You know, some people judge him by what actually took place, and I understand that, and based on that, you know, maybe he's not one of the greatest of all time, but to me he is. And you saw the self-destructive phase, and you really did not think this man was going to live to, you know, to C40, to C45. Um, and now you look at him, and this, this, this is a completely different human being. I mean, here is someone who has done so many despicable acts in and out of the sport, and yet he's one of the most beloved people, sports entertainers in the world. And people love Mike Tyson in spite of all that he's done. And, and that just that just fascinates me. I know we're, we're, it's a little bit of a tangent from what we were talking about, but it just, uh, when I think of Mike Tyson, I just can't help but to shake my head and to think, you know, the, the, the world's in love with this guy. And, and at one point, yeah, he was, you know, arch villain number one. I know. Jack Dempsey comes to mind, too. I mean, he he was the same way. People hated him. They thought he was a draft dodger and everything else, and then people learned to love him, which is actually a great segue because um, we, yesterday we did a, a heavyweight spotlight on Kenny Norton, and uh, Tony Treem is going to forever be remembered as a guy who refused to call Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali. He was calling him Cassius Clay, and uh, a lot of the younger listeners uh, – uh, you know, jumped all over him. And yesterday, of course, uh, we're talking about Kenny Norton. You have to bring up the trilogy uh, with uh, Muhammad Ali. And I made a statement many times, and, and I made it again today, that, you know, Muhammad Ali today, everyone loves him. Today, everyone loves him. He's beyond boxing. He's an he's a, a ambassador for, for life, uh, you know, worldwide recognition. He's probably the, the most recognizable face in, in all of sports. Um, but when he fought, that wasn't the case. Uh, I know myself, uh, uh, unfortunately I'm old enough to remember, uh, watching him fight, um, you know, <laughs> live. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I knew I had to put my head on a job. I knew that when those words came out, I was like, uh, oh, you know, of all guys, I got to say this to Scotty, but, um, you know, the bottom line is this. There were times I loved him and rooted for him, and then there was times I hated him and went against him. Uh, uh, what's your thoughts on, on Muhammad Ali during his active career, how people perceived him, and then, of course, today? Well, I think certainly the way people perceived him, I, I'm very similar to Mike Tyson. You know, a guy that was vilified much during his career, beloved today. Um, Ali's very much the same way. A lot of people, you know, hated him especially early on during his career, and he is one of the most uh, well-recognized you know, persons in, in entertainment and sports today. 
but but I look at it a little differently in terms of why. You know, Ali, they, people hated him. Again, this is back in the 60s, the you know, civil rights movement, a lot of racism still around, and, and Ali was very brash. I mean, now that's that's nothing. I mean, it, the way he talked, the way he boasted, you know, the, the, the trash talk is common now. We, we, we've kind of become desensitized to it. But at the time, that was something pretty big, and for an African American to be speaking that way um, was still not uh, something that's going to gain you uh, popularity among uh, white people. And he was vilified for that, as well as his whole stance on, you know, the the Vietnam War. That's a little different from a guy like Mike Tyson who actually did some pretty despicable things. I mean, Ali, regardless of what you think of his refusal to uh, uh, be inducted to the armed service, you can look at it and respect him for a religious stance, or you can take a more patriotic stance and, and, and say that you know he was wrong, that uh, he shouldn't have done that. Many other young men went over, paid the price to, you know, for the freedom in this country, and he refused, and, and you can uh, dislike him for that. That's fine. But it's a little different from, you know, chewing off an opponent's ear in the ring because you're getting your, you know, your ears boxed off or being accused of rape or saying the outlandish things that that he would say uh, to, to reporters, to, to fighters. The, the things that he did were truly despicable, were truly vile. Um, and, and deserving of, uh, of of the way people looked at him, uh, the contempt with which people held him at the time. Uh, Ali didn't really deserve that. Ali knew what he was doing too. Ali kind of you know said what he said with a twinkle in his eye. Um, he understood what he was doing, and he was very smart in in, in how he did it. Um, you know, the, the, the climate of our country has changed quite a bit. That's part of the reason why he became more accepted and, and now even beloved. You know, with Tyson, it's different. With Tyson, we've seen a character just complete uh, 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 turnaround in, in him. We've seen someone humble. We've seen someone almost seeking the forgiveness of the public and and going out of his way to show that he's a different human being and how that's not the same person. And, 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 and I think people are forgiving. And when we see that, that public display of humility, and I'll never forget being at the Boxing Hall of Fame and just seeing Mike Tyson up there, he, he just he, – the, the one thing that crossed my mind is he just looks like – he's overwhelmed that he's here. Not like some fighters that stand there like, yeah, I belong here. I worked hard. I deserve it. He just looked like, I, I don't deserve to be here among all these great fighters and among all these people. And he's so overwhelmed and humbled, he could hardly look up. I mean, it just was, was really something to see. So I think there's a difference when you look at the two careers of the fighters. Um, yeah, Ali, to me, never really did anything deserving of the hatred. It was more the way people perceived him. You know, Tyson, uh, not not so much. You know, uh, it kind of is a, another good segue into another issue that, that I'm having. Um, uh, it's kind of the same guy that's starting this uh, discussion. You know, number one, he, he made the, this, <laughs> which met most 99.9% of the people, um, that don't wear gl dark glasses that watched the Rios uh, Alvarado fight uh, felt it was entertaining and, and can't wait for a third. Uh, this one particular guy says no, but he also says um, that David Hay is the only guy and it's the only heavyweight fight that we should be looking at Vitaly for and that f Vitaly has to fight David Hay. My opinion, Scott, is that, you know, although I, I like, uh, I want to see the fight, I also believe that David Hay needs to fight somebody else. Yes, he beat Chisora, but, you know, if he, if he takes a, a, a route where he fights a top 10 contender and beats him, then I say, yes, he, he deserves a shot. But to automatically get another shot, uh, which, you know, this particular listener is, is, is suggesting, I don't agree with, and his his reasoning for it is that he's the only guy that has the talent to be Klitschko, which I also disagree with. You know, um, you know, this is a guy that's uh, fought six 
fights at heavyweight. Six. You know, and and you could question every opponent. And, and the only one that he ever fought that was really good schooled him. You know, what's your thoughts? Vitali, my thought basically is Vitaly doesn't have to fight anybody. He could walk away right now, and, and it's not going to hurt him one bit. What's your thoughts uh, from uh, from the statement from this viewer? Well, yeah, everyone obviously has <laughs> opinions, and uh, sometimes they kind of stand out from the majority, and that's fine. You know, that's what we're all about. Um, <clears throat> but... Yeah, to me, David Hay didn't deserve the title shot the first time he got it. He, he talked his way into the title shot. There's no doubt about that. He didn't earn it. He didn't beat the top heavyweights to get the shot at Vladimir. He talked his way into that shot. He insulted Vladimir to the point where he was given a title shot. When he was given that shot, he completely disappointed all of his fans and everyone that was expecting the kind of fight that he was talking up. You know, he was supposed to get in there, and he was supposed to uh, uh, knock out Vladimir, go after Vladimir, fight him the way he's fought some other fighters. But, but he didn't do it, and he's really stunk in that fight. That was a horrible fight, and he was schooled. Um, he's going to have to earn it to get another shot. You don't, you don't just, you, you, you know, you don't just uh, get a couple shots at the heavyweight title just because you want it. You know, it, it, you have to do something to earn it. You have to fight. You have to beat top fighters. Knocking out Shastora was a pretty good step in the right direction, considering, you know, Vitaly fought Chisora, went the distance with him, and Chisora did pretty well. Um, and, hey, knocked Chisora out. So I think that's, that's, that's one argument. But I think he needs two or three more. I think he needs to get in there. He needs to fight a top 10 fighter he needs to beat him he needs to earn his way to the title if he earns it then yes he deserves a title shot and i still think david hay has the potential to beat either klitschko i think he has the potential i don't know if he has the mindset that's the problem i think he has the talent he has the power he has the hand speed and i've thought that since he moved to heavyweight he has an explosiveness about him that is what you need to take the title from one of these guys, especially Vladimir. Um, but, but I don't know about his mindset. I, his, mentally, he gets in there, and then he just, he, he just freezes. And, and, and I, I just don't know if he has what it takes, uh, if he's given another shot, if he won't just pull the same thing and, just, and, 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 and not really give an effort. Um, he needs to trust in his power. He needs to trust in that explosiveness and go in there. And then try to knock these guys out because I think he has the potential to do it. I'm not saying he will. I'd probably still, you know, pick either Klitschko over him. But I think among all heavyweights, there is more potential in David Hay than just about anyone else. He just hasn't, you know, fought up to that potential. I agree. And, and you know, I, I think some of it has to do with Adam Booth. You know, I, I don't mean to bash Adam Booth, but... You know, I've heard him in in corners of of other fighters. You know, I, I, with David Hay, you know, you're right. David Hay's got some freakish power, and, and he's clearly an ath athletic guy. And you know, together they both look pretty damn good. But when I see Adam Booth in the corner of a guy like, let's say, Selkirk Guidon, and he's telling him, you know, just keep doing what you're doing, and, and the guy's getting schooled, you know, and he and he's refusing to to you know try to help a fighter with his own assets. Uh, uh, instead of keeping him within Adam Booth's system, you know, and that's what I see with, with this guy, a one-dimensional trainer. And you wonder if some of that cautiousness, you know, uh, that 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 uh, being schooled performance like he was in the Vladimir Klitschko isn't Adam Booth, too. You know, uh, uh, I think it's a combination of both, but but you never know. He, he seems very one-dimensional as a trainer to me, Scott. Yeah, it, it could be. It's hard to say, you know, is it more him, is it more David Hay? Um, David Hay talks to talk. I mean, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. But he just doesn't walk the walk when he gets the chance. And I don't know if, if that's his trainer, like you just mentioned, or if it's uh, he's some kind of mental block in David Hay. Yeah, yeah, well... We won't know, that's for sure, uh, not until he steps in. One quick thing, you, you got less than a minute. The gun-packing ghost. What's, what's your thoughts on, on that whole move with uh, Robert Gus Guerrero uh, uh, being arrested in New York with, with, a, with a pistol? Well, it, it was kind of disturbing when it first came out, but you know, as more and more light is shed upon it, to me, I think it's a lot uh, to do about nothing. 
Um, you look, here's, this isn't a guy that's trying to sneak a gun in to a nightclub. I hear all these people comparing him to Plaxico Burris. There's nothing comparing. I mean, the gun wasn't loaded. You know, it, it, he wasn't concealing it. He turned it over to the authorities. It's a, it's a case of ignorance. He didn't know the law. And as a gun owner myself, yeah, I, it's important to know the different state laws. If you're going to if you're going to travel with a gun, you have to know the state laws, especially New York, which has the strictest laws of, of just about anybody. But but let me leave you with this. It's interesting. I had a personal experience very similar to that. You know, my my, my two twins, 17 years old, and my wife were in Europe for 10 days for a senior trip, and my son. And carries a knife with him. I guess that's what you know, guys do. They think it's cool to carry knives with them. And we told him, and we cautioned him about carrying a knife around. He he went on the Internet. He did all his research to find out what's legal in England, what you're allowed to carry, what you're not. He didn't want to break any laws. He didn't want to get in any trouble. He did as much research as he could, and to his knowledge, it was perfectly legal. And he got to England, and before one of the tours, they took the knife and said, this is not legal in the country of England. He didn't get in any trouble. They just confiscated the knife, and he lost his knife. And, and to me, that's an example. He did everything he could. He thought he had investigated the laws satisfactorily and that it was okay. He was mistaken. Was there any criminal intent? Is there anything? No, not at all. And I think the same thing with Guerrero. I think he, he thought he was doing the right thing. You know, apparently the gun was for some photo shoot or some commercial, some outdoor thing, because I was wondering what's he carrying the gun for. It, it all makes sense. It all adds up. There's nothing wrong. He just was not aware that it's that serious. He turned it over. It was in a case. It's not loaded. But the laws are very, very strict, and he uh, uh, was, was not uh, realizing how strict they were. And now he's, uh, you know, he's paying the penalty. But I don't think... I don't think anyone should look at him like a criminal, like he's trying to do something wrong. I think he tried to do everything right, and it still just bit him in the butt. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, very interesting, but stupid. Remember that on, uh, you're probably too young for that. But anyway, Scott, great. Yeah, sometimes I just can't help but show my age, I guess. But uh, you, you, you remember that show, that comedy show at all? No, you I don't know, think I was alive then. No, laughing? You don't know laughing? You never. Yeah, I remember it? laughing. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I was very young though. Yeah, uh, I, I was very I know, young. I know, but I, st I still swear I have a picture of you with John L. Sullivan ringside. But uh, <laughs> anyway, great job, Scotty. We look forward to you uh, next week, my man. All right, Bill. Have a good week. All right, take care. Take care. That's Scotty Krauss giving us his thoughts on on a lot of stuff, and uh, especially the uh, gun packing ghost. Very interesting. But stupid. Talk and Boxing with Billy C now has official merchandise available on TalkinBoxing.com. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies and mugs, and yes, even undergarments. Talk and Boxing apparel is the perfect gift for the boxing fan in your life. Log on to www.TalkinBoxing.com. That's T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-X-I-N-G.com. And place your order today. Join us here for two hours as Billy and the gang do what they do best. Every time I start talking about boxing, a white man got to pull Rocky Marciano out there. Rocky Marciano was good, but compared to Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano ain't. It's Joe Lewis's ass. Joe Lewis was 75 years old when he fought. Huh? What? We're Boy. supposed to be talking boxing. It's Talking Boxing with Billy C. As Billy C. sits here in the multi-million dollar Talking Boxing Studios, sipping a fine wine before you're even out of bed. You should be thinking, damn, I wish I had a mustache like his. It's the Talkin' Boxing with Billy C show. He's Billy C, and you're not. S sucks to be you. Now let's dig into our archives and hear a rare interview when Billy C first became the champion of boxing talk radio. Uh, hello, Billy C. As the new champ, can we ask you a few questions? Why, certainly. <laughs> okay, your fans would like to know how you and your corner have successfully walloped the competition. We're not ordinary people. We're morons. Anything else? I'm a victim of circumstance. Did your success finally come when you made the show five days a week for two hours? What do you think? I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Now please tell the listeners what you've learned from making it this far. Sight 
certainly. If at first you don't succeed, keep on sucking till you do succeed. Great words of wisdom, Billy C. Keep up the great work as the undisputed people's champion with your show, Talking Boxing with Billy C. Any last words to anyone who's listening? This is your fault, you bonehead. <laughs> And uh, we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. Glad you could join us. If you don't have Fight Now in your sports channel lineup, you need to call your local television provider and tell them that you want Fight Now right now. It's that simple, man. Pick up the phone and call, no matter if you have satellite or cable, and tell them that you want the Fight Now channel added to your sports channel lineup. For all the information about the channel, you can find it on their website, www.fightnow.com. Speaking of now, joining us, he's going to give us uh, uh, this week's Blast from the Past, which is being sponsored by the International Boxing Organization, where their computerized ranking system is second to none. Check him out at www.iboboxing.com. Alex Papali joins us, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, Kevin Kelly. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Billy C. How you doing? Good choice, good choice, Kevin Kelly, huh? I mean, uh, we've already gotten uh, several emails uh, looking forward to this, and uh, uh, I guess uh, I guess I was a little premature with my email to you, huh? <laughs> yeah, the flushing flash. Uh, this was a guy that, um, yeah, I uh, was a fan of as uh, as when I was first getting into the sport, and. Um, you know, he's uh, got that uh, Northeast uh, connection, being uh, new, a New Yorker. And uh, he had the gift of gab. No doubt about that. He also liked to engage, and that's something that uh, a lot of uh, our listeners and viewers remember about uh, Kevin Kelly, and, and they respect him for it uh, uh, because uh, I, I have an email I'm actually going to uh, read, or maybe I read it yesterday, I forget, but it's actually from the other Alex, and he said this was a guy that, really could have could have chosen to to be a cutesy fighter a, a guy that could uh, box and and stay away and and fight safe but at times he had no problem mixing it up and engaging and it made for exciting fights right yeah definitely um yeah kevin kelly uh born june 29th 1967 in brooklyn new york uh like we said his nickname was the flushing flash and his trainer was uh, phil borgia and I believe they were together from the very beginning all the way to the end, uh, which you don't see that a lot in the sport. Um, I think uh, they um, started together when Kevin Kelly was 15, and I'm pretty sure he was the same trainer with him when in you know his last time in the ring, which was only in 2009. Um, Kelly was a southpaw. Uh, he and like you said, he uh, like the uh, other Alex said, he was. Uh, he could be a slick boxer, but he had serious pop, and maybe that was why he uh, liked to mix it up. Because um, you know, if you uh, if you got a nice strong punch, you want to be able to use it, and uh, in order to use it, you got to mix it up a bit. Um, I didn't um, realize this until this weekend when I was doing this research, but the very first professional boxing card I ever went to was a card at the Felt Forum. Uh, Edwin Rosario was in the main event, and Kevin Kelly uh, was on the undercard. He fought his second pro fight. He scored a first-round knockout. I remember we had seen him, but I didn't realize it was that. I knew it was early in Kelly's career, but it was actually his second pro fight. You know, it's uh, fu it's funny. I, I I was kind of forgetting about a couple of fights with with Kevin Kelly and myself, and uh, uh, after you know, I after you you know basically ordered me to do the uh, uh, <laughs> blast on him. You know, I started remembering. I was like, oh oh man, Troy Dorsey. That's right. That was a great that fight. Was you know? Amazing. You know, and, and and that was now now correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I I know that the other Alex brought it up too. But wasn't that one of those fights? Now, Troy Dorsey ended up, uh, he was one of the only real successful boxers that came from kickboxing, I believe. But wasn't that fight, the Troy Dorsey fight against Kevin Kelly, wasn't that like a main event on, on ABC Wild World of Sports or, or definitely on a, on, a, on a Saturday show, right? It was actually Tuesday night fights. Remember um, they used to have, uh, what was it, uh, Steve Albert and... Um 
Bernstein. Or maybe it wasn't Steve Albert. Maybe it was one of the Alberts, I think. And um, uh, what's his name? Sean O'Grady. Uh, oh. And it is on YouTube. I was just watching a little bit of it yet, uh, last night. And um, that is a, a, a boy, what a great fight that was. Um, there's so many punches. Uh, the way they described it in a lot of the papers was, you know, furious action. And, you know, if that, that's one of those things where one of the credits you got to give to Kevin Kelly um, is that he definitely brought a lot of attention to the lighter weight divisions. And this was in a time where we did – he was fighting in a time where you had Mike Tyson um, in the heavyweight division. Um, but – Kelly was bringing, um, you know, he, had the, he actually made a contract with HBO. He was on one of the early Boxing After Dark shows. Uh, he, he won his um, title against uh, Goyo Vargas uh, on HBO. And, um, and, of course, the fight that he was probably most remembered for is uh, just an absolute thriller with uh, Prince Nassim Hamed. Yeah, uh, and and Derek Smoke Gainer too. But what? Hold hold. Let, let's talk about the uh, the Dorsey fight um, real quick, uh, only because uh, okay. So that was a Tuesday night fights, but that was on USA Network, and wasn't Al Bernstein part of that or or no? No, I think he was with ESPN at that time. Oh, I've, I always um, thought he, I think he used to do ESPN. Used to do a lot of the top rank shows, and I think um, Al was with them, and maybe oh maybe it was Al Albert. Because we're, aren't they all related to Marv? There's like oh, yeah. three Alberts or something. Oh yeah, they're 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 it's the Albert family. They were all born with microphones, you know. Most kids <laughs> get a rattle. They got microphones, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why. I think somebody else pointed it out to me that I was wrong about um, connecting uh, uh, Tuesday night fights with uh, with Bernstein at one 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 time. But uh, yeah, Prince Asim uh, Hamed uh, for the world title uh, back in 1997. Uh, what a thriller that was. Uh, tell us about that one. That really was um, the fight where, you know, unfortunately um, at that point, Kevin Kelly, uh, it was, he had already, you know, at that point I think he had 50 wins. Um, so he was uh, the, the, the older fighter who was going to, you know, that, that was the first big test for Prince Nassim Hamed, and it was his first fight over here in the United States. And, um, you know, they got the world's most famous Serena Madison Square Garden. Uh, Kelly was a little upset with HBO with the way the fight was promoted. Uh, the thing about Kelly was that he did, like I said, he had that gift of gab, and he's from uh, you know New York, so he's in the media capital of the planet. So you got uh, two big guys with two great big egos, and uh, right there on the world stage at Madison Square Garden, and if people remember. It took the prince about seven minutes to get to the ring. His uh, ring entrance was so elaborate. And uh, Kevin Kelly was there standing in the ring apron, you know, waving to him, come on, come on, let's get on with it. And uh, by the time, you know, the fight started, uh, you know, everybody, uh, it was worth the wait because um, they both dropped each other three times each. It's a little tempest in a teapot of a fight. Uh, for, it only went four rounds. And um, the thing about it is that really was the fight that showed Prince Nassim Hamed had freakish power for his, um, his, for his weight class uh, because not, nobody was able to, to do that to Kevin Kelly at that point. And, um, and the thing also about it that the, the prince showed was that he was chinny. Um, which made him, uh, you know, um, exciting to watch. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when I started revisiting Kevin Kelly's career, I mean, the fights that he had, you know, Bones Adams, I forgot all about that fight. What a, what a, what a, what a fight that was, ended up in a draw. He fought the tough Tommy Parks, who's a, a trainer now. He, he fought uh, Derek Smoke Gaynor not, not once but twice, uh, splitting that those two fights. Uh, Eric Morales he fought. uh uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, he, he had uh, Morales. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sorry, Marco Antonio Barrera. But but recent names. You, you mentioned his last fight was uh, in 2009. He did hang on for a while. 
But recent names that you can tie him to, even though he came up on a losing end, Bobby Pacquiao, Vincent Escobedo, David Rodila, uh, both, uh, all three fighters are still active today, as well as Jose Reyes. I, I believe he's still fighting. Humberto Soto, he's still fighting, you know, so... He still yeah, he has, has a, a win over Humberto Soto. Yeah, I know, and, and he and he still got that connection. You know, I saw him uh, as a, in a training camp um, long before his career was over. I, I thought he had already retired, and and he fought in in two thousand nine. So he's been active. I mean, to this day, I, he's still in the business, right? Um, I don't know if he's still fighting, but um, I would think that you know it, it's only been four years since his last fight. Uh, I I do I. And see him on Facebook, and um, he just, uh, him and his wife just recently had a child, and um, so they're uh, new parents, and um, I, I do think that that's one of the things that's pretty impressive about his record, is that, uh, or, or, and I guess, you know, it, it does show you that timing is everything in boxing. Um, he came along in a time where there were um, two monsters, at featherweight, and one was named Marco Antonio Barrera, and the other was named Eric Morales. Uh, and yes, he fought them both, but um, unfortunately, they both stopped him. Um, and you know, that was one of the things that it, it, maybe he did fight a little longer than he should have. But at, like you mentioned, what would happen is he kept um, re, re, rediscovering himself in a way because he had the win over Umberto Soto, and that sort of led to the Barrera fight. He had uh, a win over Frankie Archuleta, and that led to the Morales fight. And then he, um, after Bobby pa the loss to Bobby Pacquiao, um, he, uh, the brother of Manny Pacquiao, he has a win over uh, Carlos Hernandez, who uh, was another very good fighter. So, um, yeah, you could never sleep on Kevin Kelly. I mean, he, was, um, he definitely had a lot of craft as well as um, uh, a lot of power for... Uh, uh, for a featherweight, and the other thing about him is that he's extremely knowledgeable. Uh, and yes, you're right, he did stay around in boxing um, as a commentator. Uh, remember KO Nation, that show that HBO had for a little while? He was one of the main commentators on that. Yeah, he, he uh, when I said he was still in the business, I, I thought he was training now. I, th I thought he had some fighters uh, that he was uh, at least tutoring, so... Uh... Uh, yeah, KO Nation ahead of its time. Fifty Cent, you know, he's gonna he's gonna take credit for for that man. Remember yeah, KO Nation? But uh, Kevin Kelly, he he pretty much had it all. You know, he he was kind of elusive in the ring. I mean, he he wasn't an easy target. He had hand speed. He could box. He could brawl. I, I mean, pretty. I guess he's pretty damn close to calling him a complete fighter. What do you think? I, I definitely, I would think that he uh, was definitely a complete fighter. And one of the things that. Um, I really enjoyed watching him because, uh, like, um, from what I heard uh, of what Scotty was saying um, earlier, uh, you know, when I, while the show was working there, was um, uh, just about, you know, the, the drama of boxing and how uh, one of the things about it is uh, Joyce Carol Oates says how every fight is a story. And one of the things that I always really, really enjoyed um, Kevin Kelly and his trainer Phil Borgia had just this really incredible chemistry and if you watch some of his old fights um, on YouTube just listen, and t listen to the dialogue between the two of them uh, in the corner they really they knew each other so well um, and just a few words and they could give and Borgia could give Kelly direction and he could change things in that next round. It's really nice to see that. And you're right. I think that that, that has to, you have to be a, a real craftsman in the ring to be able to make adjustments like that when your trainer spots something and, and points it out. I think that that's a, a, a great point. And I think it's extremely important in today or any era in a success of a, of a fighter. because and And that's my issue with these guys that haven't, you know, uh, been able to do that, or or a trainer uh, like Connecticut's own Chad Dawson, who who has a tendency to 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 change trainers, or the or the fighters that. 
that give you the the attitude like I don't need a trainer. I know everything I need to know. All I need is somebody to you know keep my cuts under control and and give me water in between rounds. You know these guys are are mistaken. You know, and not only do you need a good trainer that you're you're you know used to in terms of voice uh, focusing in, but a guy that you're going to listen to in the heat of battle, a guy that. Uh, is going to tell you do X, Y, and Z, and, and you go out there and try and do it. And I hate to bring him up because it, it, we always seem to, to find a connection with this clown, but, you know, I, I'm convinced, um, I, I'm conv- I was going to call you Eric, I'm convinced, Alex, that when, uh, uh, when Floyd Mayweather, when and if he ever gets in trouble and he really needs to make an adjustment or, or needs to, to, to do something other than have everything under control, I think he's going to fail at, at, at that um, because I, I don't think he listens to anyone else. Uh, Kevin Kelly clearly listened to his trainer like Manny Pacquiao listens to his trainer. I don't mean to use him as an example, but he does. Bam Bam Rios, you know, Mike Alvarado all listen to their trainers, and, and they've all showed success. Yeah, yeah, I think um, Bam Bam Rios is a good example because they seem to um, have that really good chemistry. Uh, things didn't work out for him um, on Saturday night, but um, they definitely seem to have that connection that uh, that Borgia and Kelly had, where they really know each other. They seem to be friends as well as um, you know business partners. It is it is a business relationship when you think about it, as well as it, um, it it's almost like a father and son or a brother a brothers you know two brothers uh, type relationship. Uh, there's whoa, 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 don't go there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not all brothers. Uh, sometimes yeah. brothers could be, um, be, well, and same thing with fathers and sons. Uh, there could be a lot of combat there. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, um, but yeah, they, they really did have a great connection. And there was one of the things, I, when I was watching the, um, uh, the Goyo Vargas fight, uh, Jim Lampley uh, mentions it, because that was a boxing after dark fight, and Jim Lampley mentions it. I didn't see an example of it, but um, that one of the things Borgia would do when he would try to get Kelly to focus, they'd put their heads together, and he would say to him, I'm you, you're me. And they had that sort of a connection, uh, and that just really, you know, it, it, gives you, it gives you goosebumps when you see that, because... Um, there's there's no no sport that has the drama like boxing. No, and and you know it, it's it's so sad that we're not seeing that type of trainer anymore. Uh, today we see a rah rah man, and it's you know I, I hate to say it, but a guy like Kevin Kelly, who we both uh, you know are, the guy fought you know uh, as recently as 2009, and and you know very well we could be seeing that last that last spat of, of a, a connection to the past where you have these uh, quality trainers and, and strong relationships with fighters. Now, don't get me wrong, Garcia and, and Rios, uh, which we're going to talk about in a second, they have a strong relationship, but you wonder um, you know, how many more quality trainers there are. There seemed to be so many back in the day, but hold that thought for a second. Kevin Kelly, uh, he uh, is not in the Hall of Fame, and uh, I wish guys like Kevin Kelly... Uh, as well as uh, Alex and my uh, favorite, uh, Marlon Starling. Guys like this should be in the Hall of Fame. This is what the Hall of Fame is about. Former world featherweight champion. His career record, 60 wins, 39 by knockout. Ten losses, stopped six times, uh, most of those uh, towards the end of his career. A couple of draws, 447 rounds as a pro with a 54% knockout ratio. Alex and I think we've seen the last of Kevin Kelly, but he fought in 2009, so we'll wait and see. Great job on that, Alex, which uh, gives me a segue to talk about you. were mentioning about the relationship with uh, Kevin Kelly and his trainer. Uh, we saw uh, uh, Robert Garcia with uh, uh, Brandon Reels this, this weekend, this past weekend. And one thing I, I think that they need to revisit um, is defense. And, and when I say that is, yes, they're, they're, he's very good with deflecting punches and controlling punches with his gloves. But I think if Rios can learn to move his head a little bit um, and, and use his jab more, I, I think that maybe he could be a complete fighter. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think he does need, um, I mean, the jab, that was startling to see him land such a, um, 
just a ramrod of a jo- of a jab in uh, in the second round. And then again um, later in the fight, why doesn't he go to that jab more? That was the only yeah, punch that, that was hurting right. him. I mean that that's what was strange about it is that uh, it, it works so well, and yet he, why didn't it work again? Um, it did seem um, that. He did. He wasn't able to make the adjustments this time, and he wasn't able to. Yeah, I, I think. I, I mean, I think Alvarado has more skills to work with. Um, I think his flaw is that he likes to slug, um, and this time he refused to be drawn into that for an extended period. And I think the knock on Rios was that. He wasn't able to use what he has, um, that ability to cut off the ring, that ability to stay in right in your chest and almost in an unnatural, uh, just like supernatural way, uh, to be able to um, endure punishment and also see openings uh, while you're in there so close. Um, that just wasn't working for him like it worked the last time. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's something that, uh, it, you know, was a failure in their training camp or uh, I, I think to a great degree it was, it was because of Alvarado. Uh, I, I think it was more him than it was, um, you know, Rios not, uh, not coming in prepared or something. No, I, I agree. I think Alvarado gets all the credit in the world here. Um, for this fight, uh, you know, he made the adjustments, he maintained it, he mixed it up. Uh, he was keeping uh, Rios off balance, uh, uh, you know, so he couldn't do the things that he wanted. Uh, uh, Rios did display some things very good, but but let his foot off the gas a little bit. Uh, Alvarado, yeah, that's, does it- that's I think the thing that surprised me the most is, weren't you surprised that you didn't see him really? really go for a knockout in the 12th that that i think shocked me well you know what i was really surprised at during the fight and i can't recall which round it was but it was the middle of the fight i i couldn't believe the instruction that robert garcia gave to to rios he said don't go to the body i don't want you going to the body at all this round and and i found that awfully strange because you know, at, during the fight, uh, the one thing that, that Alvarado was doing that seemed to, you know, score some points and, and, and keep uh, uh, Rios controlled was the fact that when he was boxing. And, and I thought that by working the body could have slowed that boxing down, you know. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, you know, obviously we don't hear that whole instruction because they flip-flop between the two corners. But I was shocked to, to hear that. Do you recall that? I don't remember that, but um, all, the only thing I could think um, was maybe he was worried because remember um, Rios did land the low blow, um, and Alvarado did go down and took took maybe you know he didn't even t- I don't even think he took a whole minute, um, but maybe it was after that round um, that he said you know try to keep him up or something and then like forego the body. But you're right um, when he was going, I think it was the the third or fourth where he started attacking the body and, and, and like the whole complexion of the fight changed. So, I, I mean, I think going to the body is definitely going to have to be something that, um, you know, in a rubber match uh, he's going to have to do. Um, so, yeah, that is sort of an odd um, instruction. You know, and that whole low blow I, I thought was borderline, and the referee just turned to Rios and, and warned him, and then Alvarado writhed in pain, you know. So I thought it was a breather. You remember the round before, uh, Alvarado was doing the, the Billy C. Shuffle after nine scotches uh, back to the corner. So, um, you know, I, you know, I, I think, hey, listen, it was an exciting fight. It picked up where the first one left off. It gave us 12 this time. Uh, you know we're in for, for you know, another exciting uh, uh, fight uh, for the third one when, when that happens. Uh, Bob Arum has indicated that uh, they're both going to take some uh, other fights. In the meantime, I think a fight like Alvarado Rios does not expire. This shelf life, so to speak, does not expire. They could both go on and fight, you know, uh, for another two years without facing each other and still have the interest in in a third fight. What's your thoughts on that? I I think you're right. And I think the other thing that, um, you know, one of the things that we're we all were worried about, you know, a couple of weeks ago was 
what does this mean now if we're going to have another, you know, the Cold War is uh, really heating up, if I could mix my metaphors there, um, between HBO and Gold, I mean, between uh, Top Rank and Golden Boy. But now we've, we see that you could have just a intra, sort of an intramural type um, Top Rank only tournament, and they would be fantastic between Rios, Alvarado, Bradley, and Provodnikov. You've got some awesome fights if you mix and match those guys. Um, that's one of the things I think on Twitter, uh, I think it was Dave Greisman, uh, uh, one of the, another boxing writer was saying on Twitter, you know, why just go right into rematches of both? Let's mix it up. And that's one of the things that they were saying. I mean, and then you have Marquez as well. Um, so you've got all these top-ranked guys that um, no matter how you mix it, that's, those are good fights. Well, I mean, I think Bradley Marquez would be good. I think Provodnikov Rios would be good. Provodnikov um, uh, versus Alvarado would be good. Alvarado Bradley would be good. Uh, I mean, Rios and Bradley would have to be moving up one division, but you know, Provodnikov and Bradley just got there themselves. So it, I think it would be an interesting. Um, it, it's amazing how you, one door closes and another one opens. Yeah, well, uh, Top Rank was actually. Uh... Uh, talking about uh, having a, a four-fight tournament between, and the fighters uh, uh, in that discussion were Bradley, Pacquiao, um, um, uh, what you call it, uh, Rios, and Juan Manuel Marquez. You know, so those, uh, yeah, there's four I, I, right I mean, there. Think about it. Any way you mix it, and you could put them together on a card. I mean, that would be incredible to have. Um, you know, like Alvarado, uh, Provodnikov. And then Bradley Marquez and uh, Rios Pacquiao or something, uh, you know, a triple header. I mean, I, maybe that's uh, too much to hope for, but that'd be pretty. That would be quite something. <laughs> yeah, that, that, let's not get crazy. Let's not get crazy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, we're having some issues with the damn stream today. I see, but uh, uh, what are you going to do? Hey, that's why people got to get fight now uh, TV and uh, watch the uh, replays, but, uh, uh, well, watch it live on fight now, but then become a premium podcast subscriber. <laughs> that'll, that'll get you. That'll get the show. But, uh, Alex, great job with this. Uh, we look forward to you next week, my man. All right, Billy C. Take care. All right. That's Alex Papali giving us, uh, the blast from the past and his thoughts on, uh, uh, Rio Salvarado and, and the, uh, talked about, uh, uh, mini tournament that top rank is, uh, discussing or, or teasing us with. Uh, yeah, and he also brought up the Cold War situation between uh, the rival promoters and networks. And we all talked about, uh, you know, Oscar De La Hoya's tweet uh, just before the Rios uh, uh, Alvarado fight. He says, I just canceled my subscription to HBO. All this crappy stuff uh, uh, doesn't help our sport. But, uh, hey, boxing's been around a long time, and it will prevail. Speaking of prevailing, I'm going to take a short break when I come back. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of emails. I got some news. Speaking of uh, Mayweather uh, and Golden Boy, we have the undercard uh, taking shape. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we got some female boxing news to talk about. Uh, one of the uh, uh, premier fighters in, in the female uh, divisions. All of that and more coming up in about two. So uh, we'll be right back. Talking boxing with Billy C. Every week, two hours of the best boxing talk on the radio. I have a bunch of questions, Donnell, right? If you feel like you want to, you can answer for J.D. first. Why will you win? J.D. Chapman, why will you win? Baby Holmes will get sick and get hit by a train that day on the way to the title. He might have diarrhea. He might have the flu. He might throw up. One of his eyeballs might fall out that day, and I might get lucky. Talking boxing with Billy C. In the real world, life has its shares of trials and tribulations, but you don't have to face them alone. This is Patricia Campanaro of Campanaro and Tomkovich. If you are facing emotionally difficult family legal issues from divorce to child custody, reach out to the team that will dedicate themselves to fighting for you, the team of Campanaro and Tomkovich. With almost 30 years of experience handling divorce, child custody, legal guardianship, visitation, and other legal issues dealing with family concerns, we can help you resolve the problems you are facing with professionalism and care. Our supportive staff is always ready to assist you with any questions or concerns you may have. To find out more about 
about Campanero and Tomkovich, visit us at duchessnylaw.com or call us and speak to a member of our attentive staff at 845-221-4099. That's 845-221-4099. Don't be surprised at court with inexperienced representation. At Campanero and Tomkovich, we have been helping our clients get the justice they deserve for almost 30 years, and we could do the same for you. Now back to Talkin' Boxing with Billy C. He may not have an Excellence in Broadcasting Award, but the night's still young. And he's got martinis. So you never know what may be by morning. morning. It's Talkin' Boxing with Billy C. Talkin' Boxing with Billy C. The one, the only, Don King. Makes me feel good, Billy, to have you, the number one show in the country, talking boxing with Billy. So I invite each and every American that's listening to this great show to tune in. This we want you to be there with Billy and me. And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing Billy C Show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. Glad you could join us. You're trying to watch us on the, the stupid feed today. Uh, Ustream has uh, really turned into uh, some garbage. And uh, we got to uh, do something else, maybe find uh, another streaming company. If you uh, are with another streaming company, reach out to me, man. We're looking for, all we ask for is a, is a reliable stream. That's it, man. That's all we're asking for. So give us a shout. Billy at Talking Boxing, T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-X-I-N-G dot com. Hey, uh, check out the website, www.billycboxing.com. And um, I, there's a, on the right-hand side, there's a um, poster or ad or whatever. Uh, it says uh, The Wilderness. And what it is is it's a movie that's going to be coming out, and it's about a uh, – uh, an Olympic boxer from Britain, and it's a really good project. And if you click that banner, you'll 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 get into the Kickstart program, and uh, it'll be a whole write up about the project and how you can get involved, get your name on the credits, all that stuff. So check it out, man. I, I totally support it, and uh, hopefully I, I'm gonna be in that film. So uh, uh, I uh, am keeping my fingers crossed on that. So definitely check that out. Uh, another thing you you guys got to remember to check out is this weekend. Uh, we're going to be doing a live boxing event from Miami, uh, and uh, we want you to uh, check it out right on LDL TV. So uh, check out the website, www.ldltv.com, for the uh, latest uh, information on that broadcast, as well as all next week we will be coming at you from uh, uh, from Florida uh, as we build up uh, uh, for the big uh, return uh, to the ring, South Center, South Senecola. Uh, in his comeback to reality fight, he has been out of the ring for 25 years. That's right, 25 years. He's going to be breaking the record uh, thanks to uh, Henry Haskup. He has uh, informed us that uh, this indeed will be a uh, boxing record, uh, 25-year hiatus uh, from the ring on the pro level. And not only is it going to be a boxing record, um, but it's also going to be a Guinness Book of World Record. So if you're in the Ferdinand Beach area, make sure you get tickets uh, you can click the fight poster on billycboxing.com or uh, go to uh, southcenacola.com and uh, get yourself some tickets be part of history. If not, make sure you tune into LDL TV. We'll be broadcasting the event live for free the way, the way webcast should be. Yours truly with Nate Campbell will be calling the action, so uh, we'll be uh, looking forward to that. Um, uh, the other thing, too, is uh, uh, make sure you uh, cast your vote uh, on uh, on our new poll question on BillyCBoxing.com. It's an interesting one. Uh, who would you uh, rather see Tyson Fury fight next? And uh, there's a, a slew of uh, uh, fighters there and interesting uh, results so far. But uh, uh, Alex T says, uh, hey, man, uh, what's happening? I'm listening to your Talk To Me Man show right now because I'm a premium subscriber and I get to do that whenever I want. And that's right. And if you become a premium subscriber... You, too, can listen to that. Uh, Alex T. says, I like the format big time. He says, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, Dwayne Ford uh, scored the second round of the Rios Alvarado fight 10-8 for Rios despite there being no knockdown. I don't think it was a one-sided uh, enough for a 10-8 score to be justified. Alvarado was rocked but gained his composure quickly. 
The reason I bring this up is the last couple of weeks I've been listening to all sorts of experts like that clown on HBO, and he's referring, he puts in parentheses, Steve Weisfeld, uh, telling me that neither of the first two rounds in the Bradley fight should have been scored 10-8, despite Bradley being practically unconscious and held up by the ropes in both, uh, held up by the ropes in both of those rounds. This just goes to show you that these guys, even the ones who do it for a living in the biggest fights, have no idea what the hell they're doing. There's no consistency even among the most experienced judges. What's your thoughts? Well, you know, we did have the interview with Harold Letterman, and Harold uh, basically straightened uh, me out on, on, on that, and he made an interesting point. Now, as far as uh, Steve West, Westfield, um, Westfield was a, was a judge for a long time. He's now um, a, uh, a, 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 I guess, another Harold Letterman uh, uh, on, on the broadcast. I, I'm not really sure why they have him, but um, he... Uh, um, he's like uh, a special addition to, to the broadcast now. Um, here's the thing. You know, in the Bradley fight with, with, um, uh, with Prodognikov, here was the opinion. The opinion, there was a couple of different things, Alex. Number one, uh, there was the issue of what is it a knockdown or wasn't it a knockdown? And if it was a knockdown, it becomes a 10-8 round in favor of uh, Prodognikov. Um, but... As Harold pointed out, even though Timothy Bradley was in serious trouble for, for those two rounds, you know, earlier in the round, and we have to judge a round by its full uh, length, three minutes, you know, during the round, they were both giving and receiving f somewhat equally. Um, that being uh, said, you know, uh, the fact that Prodognikov staggered and hurt uh, Timothy Bradley gave him the win for those rounds. Um, and, you know, the judges felt, and as well as Harold Letterman, felt that he wasn't dominating it enough to justify a 10-8 round. Now, the Weisfield comment about the knockdown um, that Jim Lampley tried to, you know, make a big deal about, what he said was that, yes, he feels that the referee missed the knockdown call, which would have resulted in a 10-8 round for Prodognikov. Uh, however... Since there wasn't a knockdown, and he went back to his original idea that the round wasn't as one-sided as you might think because of the, the, the fact that Timothy Bradley got hurt towards the end, um, he scored it a 10-9 round. Uh, I think the same should be said in the Rios-Alvarado fight. Yes, uh, Alvarado got rocked uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that fight, uh, in that round. And, um, uh, you know, uh, there was... Uh, uh, one of the referees scored it 10-8, uh, and it was justified. Now, I don't know if it was justified to be a 10-8 round in that particular round. Yes, he got hurt. Yes, he was staggering around. Yes, he was holding on. But for three minutes, no. And the beginning of the fight was, was pretty, you know, back and forth. So, I, you know, to me, I would have scored all those rounds 10-9, uh, uh, despite uh, at times both fighters uh, being in serious trouble. I think the bottom line here is I agree with Alex to, this, to the extent that we have to revisit the priority in which a judge scores a fight. We all know what the criteria to judge a fight is, but depending upon what these, ref, what these judges feel is more important to them will dictate what their scorecards say. And I think that we need to revisit the priority level um, you know, ring gentlemanship, is, is that first? Is power punching first? Is, is amount of punches landed? You know, and the damn punch stats, you know that we had our little go in and, and uh, or run in with, uh, with CompuBox and everything else. And, you know, listen, the punch stats are great for after the fight. It's a great discussion after the fight. It's a conversation piece after the fight. I wish these guys would stop it with the, with the in-fight statistics that are not true statistics. They are not true statistics. This is a subjective score being taken by human beings that are that are subjectively scoring whether a punch lands or not, whether it was in a uh, you know a, a devastating punch or not. You know, um, it, it's ridiculous for me to, or you, or anybody else to take someone else's word and 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 then discuss it as if, as if it's stats. You know, uh, we can't even uh, agree on, a, on a, a specific round if we're talking about a fight 
you know, who if it should have been scored 10-8 or not. You know, we can't even agree on on whether, uh, you know, a fighter won around, uh, you know, significantly enough to, to give him a 10-8 score. We can't uh, agree on that, but yet we're going to throw statistics out at each, out at each other uh, based on someone else's opinion. Unfortunately, boxing is subjective, and the stats are not stats. Baseball is a stat. He's up five times. He hits two, you know, twice. He gets on base. You know, you got a percentage there. You know, he strikes out 10 batters. Uh, you know, he pitched to 20. You know, you got a stat there. In football, you know, he runs the ball, you know, six yards, one carry, two yards, and another carry, two yards, another carry, and he's got 10 yards. That's a statistic. It's cut and dry. It's It's there. Boxing is not like that. It's subjective. We got to stop this. And guys like Jim Lampley rely on these stats now to even com- he can't even comment. He can't even give it an opinion anymore without looking at the stats. He won't even tell you who he think won the round until he sees the stats. And for all we know, uh, you know, you you got a guy that doesn't know a left hook from a fish hook, uh, keeping track of those stats. So listen, do I like him? Uh, you know, as a conversation piece, yes. I think they have their place in boxing as a conversation piece. That's it. That's it. It's not a stat. When you take the human element out and when you when we can have some kind of a uh, a device that can re, uh, send and receive punches and where they're landed on the body, then I will talk about stats as stats, punch stats as statistics. Right now, it's an opinion. Uh, Alex T says uh, one last uh, email here. He says, "Do you think the situation, uh, this uh, gun situation, uh, will affect the fight?" He says, "I do. I had picked Guerrero to beat Mayweather. Now I think he absolutely has no chance. This is way too much of a distraction for Guerrero to main, remain focused. Don't bet on it, Alex T. Um, here's the thing. You know, uh, if you were going to pick uh, Robert Goes Guerrero to to beat." Uh, um, Floyd in, in, in the fight in May. Um, don't change your opinion because of this gun situation. All right, don't don't change your opinion. Um, nothing is going to distract Robert Ghost Guerrero. I think he. I think I think he will get off of this uh, issue. Um, I don't think that they will uh, uh, press these charges. I don't think it, that he will do time. I don't think he'll be arrested. I don't think he'll have to worry about it. I do think that he was stupid of him. Um, I do think it, it was a big mistake, uh, but it's behind him. You can you can take that to the bank. If you're going to take the odds and go with Robert the Ghost, I don't think this is going to make an issue. I really don't. Um, speaking of uh, that fight, the uh, undercard, they've already announced that uh, uh, Daniel Ponce de Leon uh, will be taking on Abner Mares, uh for Ponce de Leon's uh, WBC featherweight title. Um, I had mixed feelings about this. I, I love both of these fighters. Don't get me wrong. I love them both. And, and I don't think that, um, you know, my issue isn't the fact that I don't believe that Abner Marys, uh, deserves a shot. However, this will be his first fight in the featherweight division. He uh, relinquished his, his title to move up, and he immediately gets a fast track uh, to a world title shot. That I'm a little fuzzy on. I, I think that fighters should fight at least one fight. Uh, in a division when they move up. But nonetheless, I think it's going to be an entertaining fight. Um, you know, Ponce de Leon couldn't have asked for a better opponent. Uh, his only weakness uh, for, with, with what we've seen in his past is when he fights a boxer, a fighter that has the ability to move and box and, and, and keep the uh, Ponce de Leon's uh, aggression at, at, in control. Uh, Abner Mares, on the other hand, he likes to mix it up. He likes to stand in front of you. This is going to be a rock'em, sock'em fight. I, I like it. It's the co-main event. Um, the rest of the undercard for at least what you're going to be paying for, uh, is shaping up to be pretty nice too. Um, uh, Gian Love, uh, who had a me- mediocre performance in his last fight, in my opinion, he's undefeated at 15 and 0 with eight knockouts. Uh, he's in the middleweight division. And once again, uh, Gabriel, uh, Rosado is going to be moving up in weight. Remember Rosado just fought triple G. He moved up from junior middleweight. Now, granted, he's a, he's a big junior middleweight, but still, I knew damn well that this guy was going to get another uh, money deal thrown at him, and he did. He's going to be fighting G, uh, G. Leon Love uh, in, uh, in a middleweight fight, 10 rounds. Um, this is actually a good fight, and uh, I could see Rosado coming out on top in this one. 
I thought J- uh, Jay Leon Love, he's got a lot of talent and stuff like that. I, I Don't get me wrong. I, I think he's got a promising career, but he didn't look, look all that great in his last fight. And, uh, you know, Rosado uh, is a tough guy, although he didn't look great getting, uh, you know, smashed to death by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Triple G. You know, he was busted up pretty bad in that one. Uh, I like the matchup. It ought to be interesting. But, again, we got, uh, you know, a Mayweather theme here. Uh, least amount of risk for maximum amount of reward. You got uh, Abner Maris moving up uh, to fight Daniel Ponce Leon. You got uh, Rosado moving up to fight Gian Love. You got Robert Agos Guerrero theoretically moving up to fight Mayweather. And also, we have uh, former WBA world champ Alexander Munoz with a record of 36-4 uh, um, and four with uh, 28 wins coming by knockout, taking on... Uh, Leo Santa Cruz, another guy moving up uh, in weight. Uh, Leo Santa Cruz is 23 and 0 with a draw, 13 knockouts. Uh, this one uh, uh, will uh, also be on the televised uh, part of the uh, undercard. Um, like him, can't complain. Some people were saying, "Oh man, the undercard's probably going to be terrible." This and that. I don't think so. You know, I think we got uh, some some risk versus reward issues here, uh, but I think they're all uh, going to be competitive fights. I like it. Thumbs up. Um, it was announced that uh, on April 19th in Atlantic City uh, on uh, as part of ESPN Friday Night's uh, Friday Night Fights, Javier Fortuna undefeated um, in the uh, featherweight division, 21-0. and He's got an interim belt. Uh, he's going to be making a defense of that interim, interim belt against uh, Miguel uh, Zamiudo, uh, who's uh, got a record of 25 wins, one loss, and a draw. Um, that's going to be uh, uh, on uh, April 9th. And uh, also on that card uh, on ESPN, John Jackson. He's 15 and one uh, with 14 knockouts. Uh, he's going to be taking on uh, uh, Serreso Cer- Fort, who's undefeated uh, at 16 and 0 with a draw uh, in the junior middleweight division. So uh, we'll be uh, checking that one out, um, and uh, um, we'll uh, we'll see uh, with that. Uh, Hanging Fire's got a quick question. He says, "You say boxing." Uh, box rec is not necessarily accurate. Is there another site that's more accurate? Listen, don't get me wrong. Box rec is a great tool, and uh, it, it, it's 90%, 95% accurate. What I meant was is that the boxing commissions do not use box rec yet um, as a uh, as gospel, so to speak. Uh, they use a, a company called Fight Facts, which you, the promoter actually has to pay for. Personally, I think it's a monopoly, uh, but uh, but that's the the reason. So um, you know, hold that thought. I think BoxRec is a great place to go uh, for uh, uh, boxing uh, information schedules, that kind of thing. Um, in the uh, middleweight division, in the female ranks, uh, Christina Hammer, she's undefeated, and she's pretty hot too. Um, she's uh, currently the WBF and WBO middleweight champion, world champion. Uh, apparently, she's putting her undefeated record on the line, 13-0 and with seven knockouts, and moving up in weight to take on the WBF super middleweight champ, which is Zita, Zakta- Zita Zakyo. And Zakyo is 15-0 and with 11 knockouts. Uh, it's going to be... Uh, uh, on the undercard of the Vladimir Klitschko against uh, Francisco Piata show uh, in Germany on May 4th. Uh, this ought to be uh, an interesting fight, and uh, you can uh, be rest assured that we're going to add it to our challenge. Uh, that's for sure. Um, Sauerland Events uh, has uh, signed a former uh, WBA Cruiserweight champ, Furat Arslan, who's uh, currently got a record of 32 wins, six losses, and a couple of draws. Um, he's 42 years old. And uh, he's ranked uh, number two by the WBO. Um, he is scheduled to fight April 27th. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering why um, Sauerland uh, signed this guy. And, uh, uh, you know, at 42 years old, you know, I, I can only think of, of, of one reason. And that reason is he's going to be an opponent uh, for uh, one of the... Uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, Sauerland fighters. Now, who that fighter is, I don't know, because uh, he already fought uh, Captain Huck, Marco Captain Huck, um, and uh, we'll have to see what uh, what happens uh, after that. Maybe a rematch. I don't know. I don't know. Um, remember, Maurice Walk fought Klitschko, and then uh, it came out that he he was on performance enhancing drugs and all of this stuff. Um, and uh, apparently, the German Boxing Federation. Um, has uh, uh, they had issued a, um, a suspension on him and fined him and everything else, 
And as you know, or maybe you don't know, um, the United States ABC Boxing Rules, which is um, not federally enforced. In other words, uh, they all do it voluntarily. Uh, so, so the commissions in the United States, they become part of the ABC Boxing uh, Commission, so to speak, and, and they all adhere um, universally. So if a, if a fighter in New York gets suspended and then he wants to go fight in California, the California State Athletic Commission would honor New York State's suspension, even though technically they don't have to, but they all do. But that does not apply to Europe. Now, we here in the United States, I know New York does, um, they will honor a suspension. So if, um, if uh, you know, Germany suspends a fighter, New York will, will see that that suspension is there and they will uphold it, at least they used to. Uh, and, you know, um, I, I'm pretty sure they still do. And I think um, the bigger commissions will all do that. Well, I guess there was some rumors flying around that Maurice Wack and his promoter, who who I thought was uh, United States based uh, Global Boxing Promotions, um, has said that uh, um, you know that there is no way that Maurice Wack is going to fight uh, until his suspension is done. Uh, that was uh, issued to him by the German Boxing Federation. Uh, I guess there was some rumor uh, that he was going to fight someplace in the states, and uh, uh, we were told uh, that that's not the case. So. Um, he said uh, he won't fight until after his suspension is listed, which is in uh, July, July 11th. Um, they announced officially that David Hay, his opponent, will be announced in a couple of weeks. So, we, you know, the drama will still be there. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, Frank Warren, who lost uh, a couple of high-profile fighters recently, um, really has come back strong, and uh, especially with the April 20th card, uh, we know that Nathan Cleverly against Robin Krasnicki is on that card. That's the new main event. But uh, it was just uh, announced that um, um, uh, Oliver McKenzie and uh, uh, Enzo Macronelli, this, the rematch, will also be on that card. So uh, that, that card is uh, f shaping up to be uh, a strong one. So uh, so much for uh, you know uh, thinking that Frank Warren is finished. Uh, and like uh, top ranks uh, Bob Arum said, never underestimate. Frank Warren, the guy's been around a long time, and he, he knows what the hell he's doing. That's for sure. Wake up. It's time for the oh. It's Too Early for a Trivia Question. Question. All right. Today's It's Too Early for a Trivia Question. Question is being brought to us by Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, check them out. they got three locations now. Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Jersey Shore. That's right. Give them a call, 718-797-2872, 718-797-2872, or uh, visit their website. You can get to their website easily by visiting our website, www.billycboxing.com, and click one of the Gleason Gym banners. You can't miss it. Um, call them up, sign up for a class, sign up for a membership, buy yourself a T-shirt, or do what we really want you to do. Sign up for the Boxing Fantasy Camp. Make sure you mention Billy C for anything you call uh gleason's four and demand a billy c discount 718-797-2872 this year's boxing fantasy camp is august 22nd through the 25th uh it's up in the uh catskills at a resort you know you regret missed it missing it last year don't miss it this year sign up now let me know as soon as you sign up billy at talk and boxing t-a-l-k-i-n b-o-x-i-n-g dot com and uh we'll get uh dax to uh uh, do a, f a story about your uh, experience. So, Gleason's Gym, 718-797-2872. All right, today's It's Too Early for a Trivia Question. Questions got a lot of people stumped, got a lot of answers, a lot of great answers, but none of them are right. Um, our trivia is supplied by our very own trivia question guru, and that is Henry Haskup. Today's question, which world champion has the longest knockout streak in history? Which world champion has the longest knockout streak in history. That's total knockouts, not just as a champion. Which world champion has the longest knockout streak in history? Um, if you know this answer, uh, email me, uh, Billy at Talkin' Boxing. That's T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-X-I-N-G dot com. Maybe it is worded that way. Which world champion has the longest knockout streak in history? That's exactly how it's worded. Which world champion has the longest knockout streak in history? Email me, Billy, at Talkin' Boxing, T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-X-I-N-G dot com. And if you're the first one to get it, you're going to win the prize. Email me right now. This day in boxing history. 
And finally, this day in boxing history is being brought to us by Campanero and Tomkovic. If you're looking for a lawyer, use the ones that keep my ass out of trouble. That is Campanero and Tomkovic. Give them a call today, 845-221-4099. 845-221-4099. Let Campanero and Tomkovic knock out your legal problem. 845-221-4099. On this day, April 3rd, in 1976, Rigoberto Riasco knocks out Waryung Nakayama in the 10th round to win the WBC World Junior Featherweight title, and that took place on this day, April 3rd, 1976, in Panama. Interesting side note, this was a newly created WBC belt for the Junior Featherweight division, and it was the first world champion in the Junior Featherweight division since Carl Dwayne held a belt in 1923 so uh important day uh uh today in 1976 hey man that concludes our show for today i do have one other thing to say make sure you tune in tomorrow morning same bat time same bat channel there's only one channel Fight Now Channel. Call your local television provider and tell them you want the Fight Now Channel added to your sports channel lineup. It's that simple. Pick up the phone and call. All the information about the channel can be found on our website, www.fightnow.com. See you all tomorrow. Ciao, baby.